Welcome to Star Notes, a Husky Media podcast, where we're sort of like Spark Notes, but not really. Today on Star Notes, we are going to be talking about Sarah J. Mass and her new book, and basically everything about her, because she's popping right now, and she has a new book coming out in like a week. And you might not want to reread everything she's ever written in order to prepare for this new Mm-mm. book. Yeah, um, I am Anna, I'm the digital managing editor here, and I have read some Sarah J. Mass, not a lot. I'm Angelina Padilla Tompkins. I'm the editor in chief, and I have read a chapter (laughs) of her work. (laughs) I'm Sarah Rose. I'm the assistant lifestyle editor, and I have read most of her works. Um, It's in her Crescent City series. It's going to be the third book in that series, and it's called The House of Flame and Shadow. Yes, it It is. It's a gold cover. It's a very pretty cover. It's gorgeous. Usually, the special editions are also really great too. I can't, I would I'll probably get my hands on one of them, um, but yeah, very excited for that. It is the third book in the Crescent City series. It's an ongoing series. I because we originally thought it was going to be a trilogy, and then she's like, "No, I'm going to be expanding it," which makes sense because her other series are like five books. Or They're more. so long. They're, They're so very long. long. I have a friend who hate reads all of them. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah. Neha, if you're listening to this, that that's you. You're the friend that hate reads those books. Yeah. So I guess before getting into the new Crescent City book, we should talk about who Sarah J. Mass is. So who is she? Yeah, so if you are a reader and you're in the book community, it's pretty hard to not know who she is. She is everywhere. Her books are so popular. She has three and she also has a lot of controversy surrounding her that's been built up over the years and so if you've heard about her it's probably because of that or because people are simping over her book characters but she i'll get into the series first she has her throne of glass can i I cut in yeah yeah, of course here's just a quick wikipedia search on sarah j mass the j stands for janet i did not know that which is not something i knew Sarah Janet Mass. Um, yeah, there's the book. She sold over 12 million copies of her books, which is insane. And they've been translated into 37 different languages, which is kind of crazy. She's 37 years old for anyone. Yeah. Who wants to all know? that before 40. Yeah. It's crazy. She's written a lot of books. Yeah, she did write a lot of books. She started out, she started writing very young when she was a teenager, too, which makes sense as to how she's accomplished so much before 40. But her first series, which I recommend people reading first, is the Throne of Glass series. Um, It follows Selena, and she's like a fae character who also has a secret identity, and I'm not gonna spoil it, but it follows her adventure through five books, I think. Five books, five or six books. Don't quote me on that. But please hold. <laughs> please hold, yes. How long is... I should know this. Authors have a niche, um, usually, and as a fantasy author, her niche is um, fae characters, and so all her series surrounds the fae, and fae are mythical fairies who are immortal, and they usually have some sort of power. Her and specific yes. fae are more humanoid than, like, little Tinkerbell. Yes, yeah. They... You can look up fan art. They have pointy ears. They're usually good looking. Um, they're very powerful. And so that's usually what she writes about. It's all she writes about, actually. And it makes sense because she's good at it. Um, and you can tell that she's done like research in the mythology while also putting a little spin on it. But her Throne of Glass series, seven books, is a really good place to start. It's YA. It's her only YA series. I don't care what people say about Akatar. Akatar is not YA. No. Um, <laughs> Throne of Glass, though, is. And it's really, really good. It's what got me into the fantasy genre because I read that when I was 15. And you know, everybody has like that mediocre series that they read when they were younger. Some, it might be Hunger Games, Divergent. Throne of Glass was mine. And it was really good. And so then I went on to Akatar because that was the second one. And Akatar has four or five books now. It's an ongoing series. 
And it started out as a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And it, it follows Feyre, who is of half fae, half human, who gets, like, captured by one of the fae and gets, like, transported to the fae realm. And that one... I See, I haven't finished it, but people have said it starts as a Beauty and the Beast retelling, and then she just, like... Then it no longer spins it is Beauty and the Beast. Into its own little I think, thing. overall, a lot of people consider um, Akatar a Court of Thorns and Roses, but that is too much to say every single time you want to say it. So it's the Akatar series. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people consider it YA. Um, I read it from my high school YA library. It is not. I would say the books overall start off in that series, at least. The first yes. couple books start with like maybe a PG-13 rating with a bunch of R scenes sprinkled in there. And then they just become more rated R and more rated R and more rated R as it goes on. Use your imagination to figure out <laughs> what that means. I don't think, I, I don't know what we're allowed There's to. no fade to black scenes here. There are no <laughs> fade to black scenes here. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. There's the one scene you wouldn't have gotten there. There's a lot of paint involved. Oh, The paint yep, scene. Yep. That's a thing. That's I also thing. know there's a sky scene there because sky scene. The, male ha- the man has wings. Um, yeah. He's a bat boy. Interesting. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to tell you about that, like, off scene. Because my friend told me that, that and I yeah. screamed. It was wild. And the tent Something. scene. There's this one line the, that yeah. Feyre says that's yeah. very out of pocket. There's just so, it's, it's questionable. Yes, it's it questionable. is. So how much of that is in the first book? Not much. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's... Scenes like that with a different guy who everyone loves at first. His name is Tamlin. And then everybody hates him very quickly. Okay. Sarah J. Mouse is very good at putting her main character with someone and then making them switch to another guy. That's, like, usually her thing. And they're, and she's good at making you go along with it and root for whoever yeah. Feyre is rooting for in that moment. There's not a... I can't think of any Tamlin stands out there. No. There was, um... This one girl who got a Tamlin tattoo on her leg after reading the first book, not knowing what's going to happen. And I know everything that happens in the books, even though I haven't read it. And she was so distraught <laughs> after being introduced to the other guy and being like, oh, so this is what Tamlin does. Everyone Tamlin turns him. out to be <laughs> Yes, he does, to I put it to plainly. Put, to God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so do all the first guys that her characters get with end up being bad or is there or is, are they different we don't know about crescent city yet we don't know about crescent okay. city throne of glass it's a love triangle and then um the main character selena she goes off and just finds someone better Good um, for her. okay um because you know some of her men can be toxic and i'll get into that later but Crescent City is a question. Question. I hope it's not the I same. I almost said Question City. <laughs> <laughs> Crescent City. Yeah, I'm curious, scared, not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Because the guy seems okay. Like, he seems he seems good. Yeah. But Tamlin seemed good. I know. So. Do you want me to give a little synopsis of Crescent City well, really quick? Let's give a synopsis of synop- <laughs> give a synopsis of Crescent City. One thing, um, my understanding of the Crescent City series, I read the first book and loved it. Absolutely it loved good. it. Read the second book and was just very let down. Um, it, there, a lot of nothing happened. It feel, felt like a very much like a 900-page filler book to me. There's a lot of scenes of just the characters talking and hanging out and just doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't attached enough to those characters to sit through 900 pages of that. Now, if Lee Bardugo went and released a 900-page book of the crows from Six of Crows just hanging out, I would eat that up. So I think it's just, it's not necessarily that it was a bad book, but I didn't care enough about the characters for that kind of content. And maybe that says something about her writing in the first book, if I loved the first book so much, but didn't like the characters as much. The plot was great. Yeah. Usually Sarah J. Mass's plot is just kind of eh, and then there's a lot of fairy (laughs) (laughs) That's usually how it goes. Um, but this book had like a good plot and I was excited to where the plot was going to go. And then the second book, the plot disappeared. The, the fade to black scenes weren't even that good and there weren't that many of them. So it's just why, why am I here? 
Yeah. You know? But th- th- those are my thoughts. Um, Sarah might know a little bit more about the plot than I do <laughs> from what I'm remembering. Yeah. So Crescent City, I ordered it online and I got into it like still kind of being a newbie, Sarah J. Mastan. Um, but it follows Bryce Quinlan, who is half fae, half human. And she also has a secret identity about her that we don't find out until the very end. It's teased. It's implied that there's something special about Bryce. The So it follows Bryce, and she gets kind of unraveled in this murder mystery investigation after her best friend and her other friends gets murdered one night. And she has to team up with Hunt, who is a fae angel. He has wings. Um, to, who's like who works for the government to solve this murder and go into this investigation and it's very very good um the first book is like 800 something pages or i think it hits the brink of 800 i just i'm so glad i read the hardcover because i remember when the paperback got released and i saw it in barnes and noble first for the first time it looked very intimidating i got the it's paperback so big i had the paperback i wish we had it but it's huge i know it's it's at my parents house chilling on the fantasy section of my bookshelf and yes my bookshelf is big enough to warrant a fantasy section i love that i just have books piled on my floor in my apartment <laughs> <laughs> but no crescent city her world building is really great and i think that's why her books are so popular is because she does a lot of great world building and the plots are always pretty immersive and she also is high fantasy and she executes high fantasy very well and the characters aren't bland they're unique and they have flaws and you can relate to them but the second book to go on what anna said is very boring and i actually had to do a reread of that over break because i couldn't remember anything and that says something because Usually, if nothing stands out from the book, then I don't really like it. And I, I do remember, I did not rate it five stars on Goodreads. Um, and the thing with the second book is it's similar to the first book, where for 300 pages, it just drags. It's very slow. And she was still doing world building in the second book, which is not necessary. Um, and so you just got to stick with it. And usually, the second book, the cursed second book, as people call it in the book community, should like pick up right after the end of the first book. And that's what we all thought, but nope, didn't do that. It only picked up at like page 500 and then it really got into the action because I only remember the end because the end was very shocking. Oh, I have a whole rant about the end. I that's rant. over halfway through though. Th- I that, know. that was my problem with um the, oh, what's it called? The Orange Tree book. The Priory of the Orange Tree. of the Orange Priory Tree. Of the Orange also Tree. A huge by the time the plot had like a lull, and by the time it had picked up on page like 600 or 700, I had given up caring and I skimmed the last 400 pages. Yeah. It's so like by the time you hit page 500, the plot finally picks up, but you're bored and you still have 400 pages left to go. You still have a whole novel to read. It's like, really? Yeah. So I guess if you're going to have a long book, I guess it's the same if you're writing a long essay or like have a long movie, you need to use your space well and it needs to be necessary. Mm -hmm. In most cases, I think this is the case with the Crescent City book too, in most cases it can be trimmed down. Like you know how you've ever, um, if you've ever seen a film and it seems to have gone on for half an hour too long, it's a two and a half hour film, it could have been an hour and 45 minutes and it's just like a chunk too long. That's what I got with the Crescent City book, Priory of the Orange Tree. It just feels like a movie that needed a decent chunk. Snipped. Yeah, I'm surprised. I I assume her editor cut a bunch down. I just wish they would have cut more. So we've we've alluded to the Crescent City book two ending. I guess me having rants is I guess that's going to be a bit on this podcast because I had my <laughs> Percy Jackson rant last time. Um, I hated it. I was so mad. I get, really? why, I get why people really liked it if they've read all the books and love all these worlds. My thing is, if you have all of these books and all of these worlds, why the f*** is there the need to connect all of them into one book and one world and make it all the freaking same? Like, I like yeah. them as separate entities. Why are we bringing them all together? To me, I mean, I'm not a diehard Sarah J. Mass fan, so maybe that's why I have this opinion. But to me, that feels unnecessary. To, like, bring all... They were all successful in their own rights. They all Mm -hmm. stood alone on their own. They're all... People love them, like, in their own individual, like, worlds and countries and categories. Why are we bringing them all together now? 
Yeah. Why does Feyre need to appear in Crescent City book two? Why is that necessary? I don't think it's necessary. And I just don't like it when authors do that, and it seems needless. Now, maybe there's a point to it that'll come up in book three, but, like, the way it was presented, they, like, walk through a portal randomly, and they're like, hello, we're here. And I was like, that feels like that was just slapped on. It doesn't change the book at all. It's like in the last chapter. It changes nothing. You could have taken it out and had a perfectly good book. Maybe made that a part of book three. But Mm -hmm. no. You throw it in as a cliffhanger ending that doesn't tie to anything else in the book. Nothing else ties to it. It's just there. For, like, shock factor. Yeah. The book was boring. You have this pointless shock factor. Huh? I don't think it was well done at all. And that is my opinion. I like the passion behind that. See, so this is going to be a spoiler, but at the end of Crescent City 2, um, Bryce, the main character, walks through a portal, and she ends up in the world of Akatar. And as someone who very well knows the Akatar characters but have never, like, read the full series, I thought it was shocking. I thought it was exciting. My only, like, qualm with it is I hope it doesn't, take up too much of the third book because like Anna said it's not very necessary and Bryce is stuck there and I don't know how she's gonna get out um but I really hope that it doesn't take up the bulk of book three because I don't want to stay in the Akatar world I'm not even interested in the Akatar world do you think it's gonna be like some cheesy team up where they try and get her out <laughs> see, that's where I think it's going see and they've been okay I kind of knew that these, her worlds were connected because in Throne of Glass at the the very last book, Selena is like falling through like the cosmos and there's descriptions of like worlds that she sees and she mentions that she sees, like it's implied that she sees Feyre and Recent, who is, like, the male main character of Akatar, And then she sees the world of Crescent City. So it's kind of like they're all connected already, um, just, like, in different universes. But it's been hinted that um, Throne of Glass will make a merge into the third book. Which would piss me off. And as someone who Why loves is that needed? Throne of Glass, Why is it needed? I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm 50-50 on it. To be honest, because Throne of Glass has been finished for years, I would have preferred if Bryce went into the Throne of Glass world instead of Akatar, since Akatar is still ongoing, because it would have been cool to just see, like, okay, where are the main characters right now? How are they doing in the Throne of Glass world? I would have preferred that. And she would have gotten a chance to go back into those characters, which is maybe why she might merge Throne of Glass, but... She should just make another novella if she wants to. Or, like, do another Throne of Glass series. Like, do, like, a trilogy with, like, different characters in the world. There you go. People would buy it. Yeah, and there's so many characters in Throne of Glass. It's a whole cast of characters. So she could choose so many. I'll have to show you a picture. But yeah, but that that's the thing she does too is like it starts off with one main character and as you get to book six, book seven, book eight, so on and so forth with all her series, a um, lot of POVs. There's more characters and more characters and more characters and it grows and builds and grows and builds and grows and builds. Yeah. So how do you like stay on track with what's <laughs> happening? Um, you have to binge read them. Yeah, I I tab my books. Okay. Um, so. I'll have I'll have to take a picture. I go home for my birthday in a few weeks, um, but the Crescent City and Throne of Glass books are heavily tabbed. So if it's like an important quote or like a character did something that I think will have an impact later on, I'll tab it and I can always go back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I just reading high fantasy so much, it, I get kind of used to it, keeping on track. But because it's exciting, you just remember everything. But it is a lot sometimes because f- in the first Crescent City book, we went from just having two POVs with an occasional third. And then in the second book, we have three or four with an occasional fifth. So okay. it's going to be more. Writing multi-perspective books is hard. hard. Um, I have a draft of a project I'm currently working on, um, but there is a previous draft that will never see the light of day again that had six perspectives. 
Um, the tricky thing about writing a multi-perspective book is the fact that, um, let's say you write your whole book, you have a draft, all of the characters are alternating where you need them to alternate, and then you find a plot hole that you have to fix. So now it makes sense for all of the different characters to be narrating different points of the story, so then you have to go and rewrite the entire thing. Mm. Not just, you can't just insert a scene or insert a chapter. Sometimes it means reorganizing your entire book. So the fact that Sarah J. Mass has managed to write so many books using this multi-perspective technique, I think that's super impressive. And they are coherent. Like, they are yeah. cohesive. It makes it makes sense why different characters are narrating different things, and They're it does needed. fit with the plot. And to have that make sense in that many books, that's a talent I wish I had. So does she... Sh- um show the same scene through different people's point of view or do they just pick up wherever they left off but on a different point of view no um because in her books there's so much going on and characters are in different places Mm -hmm. um it's different scenes um with like the romance scene sometimes they'll they'll she'll redo like part of a scene but like from the guy's perspective um because you know readers eat that up which I do too, and it's sweet. But especially during war scenes, because there's always war scenes, um, it's good to have those POVs, because like, in a war, everyone's at different spots and fighting different people. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I like it. I think it works. It's when it's done. Like, Lee Bardugo also, I keep bringing her up, but I, I love her dearly. Um, she does it well, too. Mm-hmm. And I think authors that can do that well, that's amazing. They were born to write. I think that's just a testament to that. If you are someone who likes to write, NIU does have some resources out there for you. Um, There are two fiction writing classes, um, English 302 and English 402. They're sort of alternated between um, Professor Libman and Professor McNett. Um, I'm currently in 402 with McNett. I took 302 with Libman. They're really good classes. They teach you, um, you do a lot of writing exercise. They teach you how to critique. You do a lot of just writing fiction stuff. Um, There's people that write all of the genres in those classes there's a variety of people from a variety of different majors and it's really cool to get together with other people who read and write completely different things from you or maybe you don't read or write at all and you're in this class about writing that's kind of fun there's also a creative writing club on campus um, that you can join um, if you want to have some more writing in your life we don't have a book club which is unfortunate sarah you should start one I would yeah. so start. If anyone one. out there wants to start a book club with Sarah, let us know in the comments. We'll Please. we'll get that going. We'll get that going. You'd be so good at it too. That would be so fun. I can go into the controversy really quick because I don't want to praise her so much. Let's talk yeah. about controversy. So Sarah J. Mass is really good. I love her books. Um, this is an instant where you, it's kind of like a matter of separating the art from the artist, but it's kind of hard to do. Um, But she, I mentioned that she had some controversy that's been built up over the years. And you can easily find this, like, quick YouTube search. People have done so many videos explaining her and what's wrong with her. But, and it's noticeable in her books, too. But things that she's been known for doing is usually she has an all-white cast. And she doesn't have enough um, representation from the LGBTQ community, and it's very evident in Akatar and Throne of Glass. And in Throne of Glass, especially, she only had one person of color, and they got killed off, which was for the benefit of like the main white protagonist like storyline, um, which was really sucky because she gave a lot of thought to this character's storyline even though she's a side character and she just killed her off. And I don't know about Akatar, but I've heard that there is a character that came out as gay in the series, but that yes. character proceeded to say that she only sleeps with men, still sleeps with men to feel, like, protected or some crap like that. Okay. And it Red was flag. very... I know. Yeah. It was very alarming. And then Crescent City... The thing is, like, sometimes you can tell when an author responds to their fans and listens to them. Sarah J. Mass kind of does and kind of doesn't. She got a little better in Crescent City. Like, there's more representation in there and more inclusiveness. But at the same time, 
some of the lines and some of how she like describes her character her um characters of color are very questionable and i wish we had the books here with me because i could actually quote some things but that's the controversy surrounding there i am not going to be surprised if it comes out where she like tweets something really horrendous and that'll just completely cancel her because she kind of is canceled like anna said most people hate read her books because of this controversy so even though i do love her work and i think she's a brilliant writer i'm not going to commend her for a bunch of things because i am like aware of the ignorance that in her writing has she verbally responded to any of this controversy i don't think so i haven't seen anything i would have seen the clips and i hope an interview is bold enough to ask her because that would be exciting any other final thoughts questions opinions sarah j mass edition you know i don't really have anything but i am excited for the third book Yeah, the Um, third book, Crescent City 3, House of Flame and Shadow. It is coming out on January 30th, which is... A Wednesday, Tuesday? Seven days away. I know, it's a week. Seven days away from the time of recording. It'll definitely, it'll come out next week, guys. So, that's exciting. As someone who only read, like, a chapter or so of her work um, before this conversation, I will say I don't feel super enthused As far as, like, reading any more of her stuff. I'm not enthused either, but I'm going to do it because I've gotten... I sat through the entire second book. (laughs) That's right. You guys are invested. I'm going to try to do the third. I'm going to try my very hardest. Not very convincing for me to read this book. No, you could go your whole life without reading them, to be honest. I mean, there's other authors that write about the Fae and who have high fantasy novels that do it better than her. So of the three series that she wrote, is there one that you do recommend that people read if they want to start reading her work? Definitely Crescent City. I think because it's a murder mystery inside a high fantasy novel is really exhilarating. I mean, you're really on your toes. The last 200 pages, I read them in one night. It was incredible. I read the whole thing in a day, a very long day, but it was a day. It was like an 8 a.m. to like 11 p.m. kind of day. Oh my God. Um, But high fantasy murder mystery is not, high fantasy urban fantasy murder mystery is not a combination I have ever seen before. So yeah. I thought that was super intriguing, and she did that very well. Yeah, so I would definitely say Crescent City. Um, look up content warnings for that, though. Um, it's very much a new adult book. Um, Throne of Glass is okay. It's like your, I don't want to say basic, but like beginner YA series. Um, it's good for if you're just starting to get into the fantasy genre. Yeah, because that's what it got me into fantasy. So if you're looking to maybe read a little bit more fantasy, but you don't know where to start, the Throne of Glass series might be good for you. Yeah, but definitely Crescent City. Um, I don't care about Akatar. Read Akatar <laughs> if you like her writing style and like yes. her character typologies. Yeah. But okay. beyond that... It has a huge fan it base, though. It has a though. huge fan yeah. base. It can also get pretty toxic, but... <laughs> okay, the fan base does make really pretty fan art, though. I will True. say that. So beautiful. Um, but Sarah J. Mass, she announced in a interview recently, not recently, like over a month ago, that she has, like, seven new works coming out. Or That's maybe it insane. wasn't her. It was her agent or something. That's insane. So she's continuing Akatar in Crescent City. Um, okay. Seven new books. To have that planned. I know. I mean, I'm working on two things right now, and that's too much. I, I, I wonder how she doesn't get burnt out. You know, I wonder about that all the time. I'd love to interview her. Yeah. Right? Sarah J. Mess, if you're listening, come on our podcast. Sorry, right, we just, like, trash talked you a little <laughs> bit, not- but we would love to talk to you some more. <laughs> she has to know. It's all right. <laughs> but, yeah. Be on the lookout for Crescent City 3, and I will definitely be reading it. Yeah. I need to look up the pay, page count. It's got to be over, like, 800. Oh, um, let's do it now. I will not be reading it, but I no. fully support anyone reading it. <laughs> also, like, her relationships in all her books are, like, between an, a 19-year-old, a mortal, and then, like, a 1,500-year-old man. 
because he's so we got like an edward and bella type exactly. situation happening so see much people that. that's also another controversy and people find that weird and yes i agree it is very weird but for somebody who's like into twilight into the vampire mm-hmm. diaries the originals yes i i i can it's fine it's fine they're not aging i know and like as long as the part like their partner is also immortal it's okay Here's here here's my my thing that I still find a little bit weird even with all of the immortal stuff going on. Why would a 1500-year-old man with all of that life experience, all of that knowledge go for a naive 19-year-old? Because they're I mean, what even if that 19-year-old isn't naive and has like seen stuff, there's still 19 years versus 1500 years. That's a lot of years. Because as Sarah J. Mass puts it, they're mates. That's her other thing. Remember? <laughs> she's a little cheesy. <laughs> she uses words like mates and males a yeah, lot. And it drives me nuts. I don't, that's one thing I don't like. I cringe every time like, she puts that on the page. Yeah, like he, he was a strong male. Like what? But everything okay. is like written in the universe. Like people are fated to be together. Lots of soulmate talk. So Lots of soulmate talk. Interesting. Thing. I have I have my thoughts on just soulmates in general. Lots of <laughs> lots of thoughts on soulmates in general. Oh, it's yeah. like a whole thirty minute conversation in itself. That's a separate podcast yeah. episode. Okay, stay tuned for episode. Th- no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's 